First of all, I want to thank uh, Iris Asaf, uh, who's the head librarian for organizing this. Um, you can see there's a lot of organization that went into it. It's very nice that uh, you invited Moshe to come speak. Um, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Moshe Amirav here today at the library of uh, Rothberg International School at Hebrew University. Um, I think it's very apropos that he'll be talking about Jerusalem because for me, and I think for a lot of people, Hebrew University is Jerusalem and Jerusalem is Hebrew University. The two are very much intertwined. There are two other universities in Israel, I won't name names, who have names of cities. Um, but they, they're not as closely tied to the city as Hebrew University is to Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem is a city we all love, um, and yet it's a center of conflict um, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, as most of you probably know. Questions about whether it should be divided or united, should it be the capital of Israel or the future state of Palestine, um, are questions that are fundamental to roadblocks that have been um, in the way of formal peace between the two peoples. Unfortunately, many have settled for what I call pessimistic complacency um, that has fallen upon Israelis upon the last couple of decades. What that means is that it's basically the belief that nothing will change. However, this is not true of Moshe. Moshe offers a solution that many would question but one should not forget that Moshe has close ties to this city. During the Six Day War, he was served as a paratrooper and was wounded in the Battle of Jerusalem on the day that Israel was captured. From 1981 to 1980, 1993, which many would consider the golden years of uh, Jerusalem, he worked closely with the mayor of Jerusalem, Teddy Kolik, um, in, char in charge of planning and development. And Moshe has personal roots here, uh, raising his family. Um, in the city. For those who have not yet had the pleasure of meeting Moshe, you'll see today that he's both an original thinker and possesses a very charismatic personality. I'm happy that we had a chance for him to teach the course on the Arab-Israeli conflict this summer and very honored to welcome him to speak today. Thank you. Thank you. Student from all over the world. Actually, that's the reason why I was very happy to teach this course to my students who are here on the Israeli Arab conflict. I was even happy that we had the war right now and not, let's say, in two months from now, because they could get the feeling of what is it to be in the war. The feeling that we Israelis feel for the last 50, 60 years, every, every some years. So the struggle on uh, the land of Israel, or the struggle. The struggle on the Middle East is going on for so many years. We, I mean, in this class, we went through it from the very first years of Zionism into these very, very days. And uh, I, uh, the first meeting of our students in my class was, I told them before we speak about anything that has to do with the conflict, I want to show you the conflict. So we took a bus and we went all over Jerusalem to see the city of conflict. In the Bible it's called city of peace, but I call it the city of conflict. <laughs> and I explained them not only where I fought as a paratrooper, I just showed them this is the place where I was wounded, this is the place where I was standing and shooting at the uh, Jordanian Legion here in 1967. This is the place where I was wounded. And when I told them, I also added that I'm uh, the last conqueror or liberator, you choose the term, of Jerusalem. We had 40 conquerors or liberators of Jerusalem. I can count them, it will take uh, a few minutes. So I will just tell you, this is a city of war. For the last 5,000 years, it uh, had more fighting, more wars than any other city you can imagine on the globe. So, telling in my course actually about the conflict, we have to start with Jerusalem. And ending the course, as I do now, because we are finishing this week the course, 
is finishing actually in Jerusalem again. So I left the issue for my students to the last one, and I'm happy that all of you are here so I can uh, share with you this uh, uh, part of my course. It will not be academic today, I will try to do it more a kind of a story. It will be even more than just a story, it will be uh, my story, if you don't mind. Because my story, as you understood already, is uh, interwind into this city, in the conflict and in the search for peace. The city itself is a story. I always say it, and it's more than just facts. Many years ago, I was invited to a conference, a very interesting one, by the King of Morocco, Hassan. And in this conference, it was a conference in which uh, uh, delegates, foreign ministers, prime ministers from uh, about uh, 40 Muslim countries were sitting. And the issue was Jerusalem. I mean, you will be surprised how many times the issue of Jerusalem appears on international conferences, especially in the Muslim world. And if you don't know, the king who invited me is, the, he is in charge on the issue of Jerusalem in the organization of the Muslim countries. There is something like that. So for me as an Israeli, uh, it was uh, quite uh, astonishing to stand up in front of uh, about 100 people, Muslims from all over the world, and telling them about the conflict in Jerusalem. And of course, the lecture is about how can we reach peace in Jerusalem. So I started by saying that Jerusalem is a story, actually. The facts are not so important in Jerusalem. The story is important. And one story I would like to tell you, uh, I tell them, about uh, Jerusalem is the story of Muhammad. And the minute I start with Muhammad, I see that they are looking at me like this Jew, this Israel is going to say something about our prophet. And they say, yes, Muhammad, the prophet. There is the story that he came to Jerusalem at that uh, night with the uh, angel of uh, Gabriel. And uh, he was standing here on Temple Mount and uh, even today, you know, when you go, the Muslims show you the print, the print of his uh, foot, of his leg, on Temple Mount, which means that he was here. And they say, but you know, this is a story. It has no whatsoever evidence, archaeological or historical, that it happened. And the more I speak, I see they are getting white in their faces, looking at me. They couldn't understand how I can, how I dare to insult them with the name of, the, of Muhammad. And they say, but it's not really important. The minute the story exists for millions of Muslims, this is the truth. <coughs> but don't think you are alone. There is another story going on about a guy named Jesus Christ. You've heard about him. Jesus Christ was buried and there are millions of uh, Christians who are coming to Jerusalem showing and they show them the place where he was buried. He was not buried there. That's inside the city. According to the archaeology, he was buried outside of the city. But you are not going to confuse us uh, Christians, millions in the world, with the details like that. Is it really here or not? So when I spoke about Jesus Christ, I saw they a little bit got relaxed. And then I said, I'm Jewish. I'm a Jew. When I come to Jerusalem, I go to the Wailing Wall. And the Wailing Wall, which is considered by most of the Jews as the part of the temple, or evidence that this was the temple, this is also a story. It has nothing to do with archaeology or any historical fact. The Wailing Wall is not part of the temple. It's a wall that was built, maybe by Herod, we are not sure, but it was built as a, a, as a, I would say, stopping, standing near the mountain, which is Temple Mount. But it has nothing to do with the temple. But try to tell any of these Jews who are praying there, especially the religious one, that 
this is not part of the temple. They'll kill you. So in other words, uh, I continue speaking about uh, the solution. How can we have peace in this city? I mean, peace between Muslims, Christians, and uh, Jews, but especially between Israelis and Palestinians. It was just after I went to Camp David with the uh, Prime Minister Barak, his he's assistant. Actually, I was chairing the committee that brought the ideas for a solution, political solution in Jerusalem. And we were sitting with uh, Arafat and uh, with the American President Clinton trying to find a solution for Jerusalem. A solution that will satisfy Christians, Muslims, Jews, but basically Israelis and Palestinians who war, who fight on this city. Still, even this week, these very days, So if Jerusalem is a story, but it is a kind of a holy story, it's a story that touches everybody. And when I say everybody, it's really so many people. I met once with uh, a Muslim uh, leader. He was uh, a former president in Indonesia. And he said to me, you know, Moshe, when I see your soldiers on Temple Mount, hitting the Muslims who came to pray. I feel that they hit me. I said, yeah, but you know, it's political, it's demonstrations. He said, but this is my place. This is the place of Muhammad. He's from Indonesia. 200 million people in Indonesia, Muslims, care about the mountain here. I mean, these are things that, uh, you know, at the moment I was surprised how many people are really involved in this conflict. But coming back to my lecture, because it's part of my lecture, Jerusalem was always and will be the focus of the Israeli-Palestinian, Israeli-Arab, Israeli-Muslim conflict. So if I say it in other ways, if we find the solution for Jerusalem that will satisfy, and I'm going by this order, <coughs> Israelis, Palestinians, Christians, Muslims, Jews. These are all the partners here. These are what we call in political science the players here. And there is also another player here that very few speak about. I'll tell you about this player. When I was with uh, my Prime Minister Barak at uh, Camp David, he said to me, Moshe, you are a professor, political science. Bring me all the places in the world in which we can take a kind of uh, analysis and see what can be adopted here in Jerusalem. Belfast, this, I mean, we have enough troubled cities in the world. Bring me a kind of example. I say, Mr. Prime Minister, I can't bring you because there is no place <coughs> in the world or any city and there are divided cities, as you know, Cyprus, I went to Cyprus, it's divided. More divided than Jerusalem. But Mr. Prime Minister, this city has what we call in political science, an actor, you know, we have actors. One actor, that because of him, it makes it so different from all the other cities. Who is this actor, said to me, the Prime Minister? God, Elohim in Hebrew. Allah in Arabic. He is an actor here. He plays a role here. He is, uh, he is here. You hear his name here all the time. In every riot, his name comes up. Every Friday, every Saturday, every Sunday, his name is here. You feel him here. My children, they left Jerusalem. I mean, nothing new. There are many Israelis who live in leave Jerusalem in the last 20 years. They go to Tel Aviv. Not far, 60 kilometers from here. And uh, they say to me, you know, Tel Aviv, that's another world. That's another country. Tel Aviv is Israel. Jerusalem is in Asia. And Tel Aviv, we're in Europe. And I say, yes, of course, 
in Tel Aviv you live. But we have a saying in Jerusalem, we know why we live. And the conflict goes on, even today. So I would come to the very sources of the conflict, which is religion. But it's not only religion. It has, of course, other uh, elements, aspects that I will speak about. But basically, it's religion. And in the name of Jerusalem, we have here the uh, fighting between the Muslim world and Israel. <coughs> when we started the course, I told uh, my student that everything started in the beginning of Zionism. What is Zionism? It's Zion. Who, where is Zion? Zion is the mountain here, Jerusalem. We Zionists, in the history, we had all kinds of uh, uh, opportunities to go to all kinds of places. Starting with uh, Uganda and many other places that were offered us in the 19th century, 20th century. Maybe we'll have our country there. It's a new country anyway. And we say Zion, only Israel. This is the only place. Why? Because here was the temple for our forefathers. <coughs> I always tell this very personal story when I was a child, a very small one. My parents, refugees from Europe, went to Marseille after they were in Russia in the war to take a boat to Israel, Palestine. And, uh, I mean, I was two years old, I don't remember it, but this was the story my mother tells me and my father proves. They were calling, where to go? My father said to my mother, let's go to America. <coughs> In Yiddish, the Golden Medina, the land of uh, honey, of gold. <laughs> let's go have business there, because, you know, he started already in Germany when, with the business, and he was into making business, making money. My mother, who always said the last word in my family, <laughs> said, no way, we are going to Palestine, to Jerusalem. After we have been here in Europe, this is the only place I go. You can go alone to New York, I'm going to Jerusalem. Of course he went with her. That's why I'm here, otherwise I would be a teacher in a New York University. I'm telling you the story because only through these stories you will understand the importance of Jerusalem in the conflict. Now when we went to uh, Camp David, when I prepared, I had a committee to prepare the issue of Jerusalem. You know, we have certain issues in this conflict. It starts with simple place, things like water, and then it goes to more complicated settlements and then borders, and then uh, refugees. And then, then we have this small problem, Jerusalem. So I was in charge of this small problem, Jerusalem. And the uh, question was, what kind of compromise can we have, we, Israelis and Palestinians, in this city, which is a uh, United city, one city that has one third of it population, Palestinians. And we were talking about it uh, before we went there. And I said to the Prime Minister, you know, Mr. Barak, we will have to prepare the whole issue of Jerusalem because in my opinion, that's the most important issue and the most difficult one among all the issues that will be put on the table in Camp David. And he said, uh, yes, you prepare everything, but uh, I don't want you to write anything. I mean, everything will be in your head. You have your team. Bring all these ideas to me. I don't want anything in writing. I said, OK. And then, when we came there, I again and again asked him, Maybe we can start with Jerusalem as the first issue because it's the most important one. He said, no, this will be the last one. I said, but this is the toughest one. He said, 
in Hebrew it's called, he says, smoch, smoch alai. Trust me, I know how to deal with it. And I said, uh, I don't think, Mr. Prime Minister, it will be so easy, because this is the toughest issue in this conflict. And he said, why, why do you say it? We have um, much more difficult issues. We have the issue of refugees. And we will have to find a solution to a problem that I still really don't know how we are going to do it. I mean, it's not only a symbolic issue of the refugees. It's a practical one. We will have to agree to a number, maybe a small number. But Jerusalem, Jerusalem is very easy. Say, so do you think it's easy? It will be very complicated. In the end of the day, in the end of the summit, I'm telling you the end of the story, the summit failed because of Jerusalem. Actually, not because of Jerusalem, it's because of the old city. Actually, it's not the old city. It failed because of a very small, tiny place called Temple Mount. What would be the solution on Temple Mount? This mountain that has nothing on it, no strategic importance, no oil there, nothing there. <coughs> this mountain is the symbol. And uh, I say to the Prime Minister, this is a very important symbol for the partner we are going to meet, Arafat. This is for him, that's their story, not history, story. He said, what story? I said, the story of Islam, the story of the Palestinians. He said, what do you mean? He said, I'll tell you a story about a meeting I had with Arafat some years ago. And uh, in this meeting, he told me that uh, we were speaking about history. You know, we started already when you go to these guys, it's very good to start with stories, jokes. And then we go to, to the practical issues. So in this meeting, he asked me, who is your uh, hero when you were young? He said, my hero. Actually, I had a hero, Mr. President. He was the president. My hero was Hannibal. Have you heard about Hannibal? The Roman wars against him. He said, why? Because he really gave me this uh, vision that if he would win there in the wars <coughs> against Rome, I mean, we the Jews, we would be the Christians of the world, because if he would win, no Christianity, no Palestinians, you will not be here. It's said, interesting. And I also have a historical uh, leader, uh, war, warrior, in my history. I said, Mr. Arafat, as uh, Chairman Arafat, I know who your leader is. He said, guess who? I said, Salah Adin. He said, yes, how did you know? Very simple. Salah Adin is the, uh, the leader, the, the, the warrior who fought against the Crusaders and after 200 years threw them out of Israel, of Jerusalem. And I knew that this, he is his leader. He said yes, and for Arafat, and for Arafat, I say to Barak, for Arafat, the most important thing is to come to Jerusalem when the peace will be signed, and bring back the manbar. Manbar is the place where the prophet, the uh, Friday, you know, the, they have this uh, what the word? Muazin. The muazin. The muazin. Yeah, the muazin is standing near this. Uh, important uh, thing, and he stands on it. And this was something that Arafat uh, had in Amman. He left it there after the big fire that was here in 1968, and it was renovated in Amman. King Hussein was keeping it, and then King Hussein wanted to bring it back to Jerusalem. Arafat said, no, 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 it will stay there in Amman until I come to Jerusalem with the manba of Salah Adin. So I was telling all this uh, to my Prime Minister, and I asked him, so what do you think? 
Don't worry, it will be okay. We will overcome all these uh, stupidities. We are going now to have peace. And in the end of the day, we didn't have peace. And uh, uh, the whole issue fell because of Jerusalem, because Temple Mount. Because the question was, whose flag will be on Temple Mount? I mean, there is no place on earth that doesn't have sovereignty. So what sovereignty will be on Temple Mount? And the issue of whose flag will be on Temple Mount took, I would say, about uh, a third of the time in, uh, in these uh, 10 days that uh, we were there in Camp David. Which flag should be? Flag is sovereignty. And in the end, Clinton came with the idea that let's leave sovereignty in a kind of a vague way, or let's split it. I mean, you Palestinians, you will have to, your flag on uh, the mosque up there, and sovereignty. And you Israelis, you will have your flag and sovereignty down there, you know, the Wailing Wall. Arafat, of course, said no. The whole mountain is one mountain. And I know the Jews. The minute they will have down sovereignty, they will dig a tunnel right <laughs> up. <laughs> because actually what they want is to destroy our mosque. He was very serious about it. And Clinton was standing astonished. He didn't know what to do with it. I mean, he, he never, he had not been in this kind of conversations. Now, one word about Clinton. I must tell you, he was really, and I call him like that because, you know, my book, I'll come to my book in a moment, is about, uh, it's about the syndrome, Jerusalem syndrome. And I told you a little bit about the Jerusalem syndrome when I was speaking about Arafat. He had this syndrome. The syndrome that believes that he is designed by God to do something here and save the honor, the fame, the city. And Barak too. Barak said to me once, Moshe, I can't give up on Temple Mount. That's the holiest of the holiest places for us. And I said to the Prime Minister, but you, Ehud, you're a kibbutznik. <laughs> You've never been to a synagogue. <laughs> You become religious now, yeah? He said, no, no, it's not religion. It's just that this is the place that proves our holding all over Zion, Jerusalem, Israel. He said, oh, my God. He's like Arafat. <laughs> and then comes Clinton. And they speak with Clinton. And he knew every, I wouldn't say every street, but almost every street in the whole city. Because we had to deal with the whole city. And I saw how he was so emotionally about the city that I can tell you, these three guys, they were really into the syndrome. And when this is the scenario, I mean, you will not be surprised that we couldn't reach a solution in Jerusalem. If we couldn't reach a solution in Jerusalem, we couldn't reach a solution between us and the Palestinians. So here we have the background to my book. I mean, uh, when I came back from Camp David, I said, okay, so peace I can't bring, but at least I have a book out of it. So that's the book. I wrote the book uh, uh, in order to try and uh, explain what happened to us Israelis. I mean, basically it's in Hebrew for Israelis, but it was translated also to English. What happened to us Israelis with Jerusalem, part of it I just told you in my introduction, but what happened to us is that we, in 1967, we got this uh, euphoric time. We believed that God is with us. I believe that God is with me, because I was fighting here as a paratrooper. And uh, all of us, we were in this feeling that now, this is the time where history tells us that we have to liberate Jerusalem, put our sovereignty over the city, and be here forever. 
This is how I felt that night. Mm -hmm. And through these feelings that uh, this is uh, Jerusalem, we started to rule Jerusalem. And we are ruling, we, I mean, municipality, Israeli municipality, that I was part of it, I was working with the college many years here. The government, we thought Jerusalem, liberated Jerusalem, will be handled from now on as an Israeli city. And we put uh, a list of uh, national targets <coughs> that we say we are going to achieve them in the next few years. And the book is actually a disappointment of me as an Israeli Jerusalemite, Israeli who is uh, part of the process that is going on, because I was working with Teddy Kolek in the city. And the disappointment is that actually no one of the national targets that were put by the Israeli government in 1967 was achieved. I mean, I analyze in this book all the things that the government decided what they would like to have in Jerusalem, starting from numbers. We didn't want to have only a majority of Jews here. We wanted a big majority here. 51% is also a majority. But we said, no, no, we have to have 90 to 95%. I have all the documents here. And we put a lot of effort here. We, we put a lot of uh, money here in this city. When I calculated here the equivalent of money that were put here and in the West Bank settlements, you know, Israel made this big effort to settle the West Bank. Okay. The effort was building something like uh, around 50, 60,000 units all over the West Bank. In Jerusalem, the effort was much bigger than all that <coughs> Israel did since 1967 till today in the West Bank. We were building here 60,000 units in East Jerusalem. We were putting new roads, highways, infrastructure, something around $20 billion in uniting Jerusalem. We were uh, sure that uh, in a year or two the Palestinians will uh, accept Israeli citizenship and be Israeli citizens and we will be very happy. They will be like the Israeli Arabs. You know, we have in Israel, we have the Palestinians who actually in 48, we say to them, from now you are not Palestinians anymore. You are Israelis. Here we have a passport, citizenship, and uh, ID card, and they accepted it. They didn't have a choice in 48. But in 67, they had a choice. The Palestinians didn't accept the Israeli passport, Israeli citizenship. And they said, no, 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 we don't want to be Israeli citizens. Which was a very big disappointment for us. Because this means also that they boycott the Israelis in their rule in Jerusalem. Actually, they say this is an occupied city and we are under occupation. So, what do we do? We were sure that they would be very happy that we came. We brought American Western civilization to this city. Very soon it would be Tel Aviv. This will be the richest city in the Middle East. <coughs> I'm quoting now. Uh, policy aims from government and city papers. This will be the richest place in the Middle East. And this comes to another uh, objective uh, target that Israel had, to make this city the center of the Middle East. Tel Aviv, the Tel Aviv of uh, the Middle East, Beirut of the Middle East, it didn't happen. We failed. This city became poorer and poorer every year. I don't know if you know, but today Jerusalem is the poorest city in Israel. 
we have their numbers every year. Tel Aviv is the uh, Jerusalem is the last one. Even Bnei Brak, we have a small town, you know, not small, of uh, religious uh, families near Tel Aviv. They are number 48. In 49, Jerusalem, the last one. So even this dream didn't come true. We were sure that after the big uh, victory, the whole world will recognize Jerusalem now as the capital of Israel. We put a lot of effort, international effort, starting from our friends, the Americans, and going all over to Europe, Africa. How many countries in the world today, except Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, do you have any idea? None. Even North America, United States, our best friend. Even they don't recognize Israel as the capital of Israel. And the embassy is in Tel Aviv, as you know. Another failure to achieve what we thought will come easily. It will take a few years. And speaking about the majority, we have the numbers. Now, I'll tell you something that when I tell it, some ministers in the government, they say, Moshe, don't exaggerate. I mean, I said, OK. So I'm going to exaggerate now and tell you that in 10 years, the Palestinians will be a majority in this city. I will tell you more than that. Even today, I, as a Jerusalem, I am in a minority in the city in terms of a Zionist. Zionism or Zionists are in a minority in this city. Because 60% of this city are not Zionists. Most of them Palestinians, of course. But the ultra-Orthodox are also not Zionists. And on the day of remembrance, before the day before the day of independence, where we are standing at 10 o'clock in the morning, the whole country stands still. For those who fell in the Israeli wars, I stand there in Jerusalem, quiet. In this part of the city, the religious part, nobody stands. They don't care. This is the Zionist state. They're not Zionist. So these are the numbers. When I say to some prime ministers, they have all kinds of uh, uh, answers and uh, illusions, what will be in the future. But no one, I'm telling you, no one has a real answer to that. Now, how did it happen? You should read the book of uh, Barbara Tuchman. Have you heard about the book of Barbara Tuchman? The March of Forties. I love this book. She's a historian, philosopher, American, who writes actually about uh, uh, the failure of governments, not only the American government in Vietnam, she takes the Vietnam uh, case, but many other governments trying to reach all kinds of uh, targets and fails. This is what happened here. We Israelis, we failed in many of the things we wanted to achieve here. We wrote it as targets for the government. So what is the conclusion of all these uh, things that I'm saying now? I just, I'm saying it because I want you to understand that this is very complicated. It has to do with the issue that is not so simple as settlement. Settlement is very easy. Security, very easy. Refugees, very easy. Symbolic numbers. Jerusalem is a problem. Now I come to my book, as I told you, I wrote this book in order to, for the Israelis, to show them in a kind of a mirror what's happening in this city. And also options. So I say, I will say a few things about options for a solution that I offer, that I recommend my Israeli friends. I'm not going to tell it to the Palestinians or the Americans. I'm telling it to our leadership, Israeli leadership. As I said it to uh, Yitzhak Shamir, the Prime Minister, and then uh, El Barak, and uh, 
I will say to Netanyahu if he will ask me. He's not asking me. He's busy. <laughs> so the solution that uh, I can see for the city, the only solution I can see for the city, is a kind of a compromise. Now we all know what a compromise is. A compromise is that we don't get what we want. We get part of what we want. And we have to see if we can live with this part of what we want. Now, the idea I brought to Camp David, I analyze it much more in the book, is the idea of a divided city that is running as one city, together and separately. Now, you can say, how come? I mean, is it going to be one city or two cities? Both. I won't get into the, all the elements of what I'm speaking about, but it can be two cities. It is one city. An open city. We don't need a wall. I mean, if we need a wall, that's it. We, that's not what I'm talking about. Because if we have peace, why do we need a wall? If we have peace with the Palestinians, this wall that you can see here, we can destroy it. We don't need it anymore. So this is about the two cities. But more than that, I think we can have a metropolitan area that is going to be economically the most important one in the Middle East because it goes from Ramallah in the north to Bethlehem and from Bet Shemesh to Jericho by national. We have the same numbers there. And this will be the metropolitan area of Jerusalem. 50-50 percent of Palestinians and Israelis. This will be the center. It will be half an hour, 45 minutes by car from Amman. 45 minutes by car from Tel Aviv. And in the city, we can have things that are together. We don't have to split everything. I brought, uh, for example, an idea that I elaborated into it and brought it to Barak about the airport here, not far. International Airport of Jerusalem, El Quds. That will be with two terminals. We have it in Europe. I don't know who of you in Europe have been to uh, Basel, for instance, they have uh, two terminals. One, you go to, the, to, to uh, the airport of the International Airport of Basel, you go to the left, you go to France, and the right to, to, uh, to Switzerland, you know. And you have two different police that are checking you. We can have it here in Jerusalem. And many other things, I'm not going into the whole plan now, I'm just telling you that it is possible. It looks like a dream. But this is a country of dreamers. The first one who made this mistake bringing a, 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 a idea as a dream was Theodor Herzl. Have you heard about him? I mean, when he was speaking about a country, a state, an Israeli state in the Middle East, it was crazy to think about it. So this is my dream. You don't have to share with me this dream. I mean, El Barak didn't share with me this dream. Netanyahu wouldn't like it either. But you have to have a dream. And you have to have a way in which these two uh, uh, people, Palestinians and Israelis basically, but also Christians and Jews and Muslims can live together in one city, which is so important for them. And we don't want to, uh, to, to cut it into two. And I will end with a story, another story which uh, a meeting I had many years ago with uh, the Palestinian, <coughs> I, I don't think any one of you knows the name, Khaled El Hassan. If you look for this name, he is like the Theodor Herzl of the Palestinian movement. He brought the ideas of Palestinian movement in the 50s, 60s. He is the father of the Fatah. Arafat is a student. And I had a meeting with him when we spoke about Jerusalem. And he said, Moshe, I know that you are like the Israelis who's very, very strange thinking about one city. Can you explain me this thing with uh, one city? So I told him what I just told you. And he said, no, Moshe, I don't think if all, all the Palestinians think like me, but I think it's a brilliant idea. I'm with you. I don't want to share of this city unless 
it's one city. It can be politically divided. And you know, Moshe, we have a saying in Arabic about this uh, pearl, a special pearl that the king has. And somebody says to him, let's cut it into two so we will have two. Say the king, no. This pearl is unique. It's the only one in the world. The minute I cut it, it's not anymore unique. The minute we will split Jerusalem, it's not Jerusalem anymore. It's not, nothing unique here. It's not interesting. So the question is, if this dream I have can be realized, but we don't know if we can solve the problem, the other problems. Small problem like we have now in Gaza with the Hamas. Hamas is not ready to split the city. They want this city. The Hamas says, we don't want the Jews here. I mean, they are ready to have the Jews here, not as Israel, not the state of Israel. So we are in a very, very difficult neighborhood in this area here, with Palestinians who don't want anything to do with the Israelis. But we have some Israelis who have the same ideas. They don't want to have anything with Palestinians. They don't think Palestinians deserve a state. So we have extremists on all sides. But basically, after this uh, very pessimistic lecture of mine, I would like to say a few words to cheer you up a little bit. <coughs> so I am optimistic. I believe we can and we will have peace in the Middle East. You know, sometimes when we have crisis like that, uh, journalists are calling me, and especially I like the journalists from the New York Times. I like the New York Times since I was studying there, reading every day the New York Times. And he says, Moshe, I want to interview you. I said, yes, of course, I know why you want to interview me, because I'm the only optimistic one among all the Israelis you are interviewing. He said, yes, exactly. <laughs> so he is interviewing me because I'm optimistic. So I am optimistic. I'm optimistic living in this uh, country, living in this city, troubled city. And uh, for those of you who are interested in the book, I, I'm not selling it, but you can get it into, uh, in, uh, Amazon. in Amazon. I, I don't know the number, but through Amazon they sell this book. And the book is actually a personal story, as I told you right now, with a lot of stories but with uh, uh, very uh, hard facts about what happened in Jerusalem and why is it a conflict and why is it in the center of the conflict. I will stop here because I'm sure you have uh, like uh, 100 questions now. So I will uh, be very happy to answer your questions. Okay. I see you are in a shock, all of you. <laughs> Yes, please.